एवरीवन वेलकम टू पॉजिट्रॉन एकेडमी एंड टुडेज टॉपिक ऑफ डिस्कशन इज ऑन ओवरव्यू ऑफ थेरापूटिक रेडियो फार्मास्यूटिकल्स एंड इट्स अ पार्ट बी ऑफ द वीडियो एंड इफ यू हैव नॉट वॉच द पार्ट ए प्लीज डू वॉच पार्ट ए फर्स्ट एंड देन वॉच पार्ट बी सो टिल देन वी हैव डिस्कस्ड अबाउट क्रॉस फायर इफेक्ट एंड द बिस्टेंडेड इफेक्ट इन डिटेल्स सो नाउ लेट एस मूव फॉरवर्ड इन द सब्सिक्वेंट प्रेजेंटेशन so in order to treat a microscopic disease we have to use an alpha emitting radionuclide for example we have a microscopic lesion over here and in order to treat this lesion we have to go for using a alpha emitting radionuclide why so because they have lower range and most of the energy will be deposited on the particle itself on the lesion itself and lead to good therapeutic treatment but if you go and use a beta emitting radionuclide as we know they have larger range as compared to the alpha particle so most of the energy won't be lock won't be deposited on the lesion but rather it will be localized in the surrounding tissue and because of this there will be some normal tissue toxicity because of radiation induced reactions fine and that is for the treatment of microscopic disease we have to go and use alpha particles and they are ideal since they deposit their energy Uh, and these are high energy over short distances and are of high lead values and high rbe also and uh, and uh, radionuclides with og electron and other low energy electrons they have short shorter range and if you go and see this list over here the in the case of iodine 125 it decays by electron capture and they have a lower range also that is in 10 nanometer fine so if you go and see the energy of the beta particles which it emits so energy is very less which is equal to 0.40 kev so if such low energy is being deposited locally in the nucleus so then then damage to cellular dna will be the highest so those red nucleides which decay by og electrons or any other low energy electrons they have a very short at range less than 50 nanometer and if these radionuclides like iodine 125 get localized on the nucleus then most of the energy will be deposited locally and thus damage to cellular dna will be will happen we have seen a lot about the radionuclides that are being used in therapy part of view so now the next question is how these uh, radionuclides are being produced that's the major question so if we look at the production part though this thing will be dealt in very uh, briefly because whenever we will be dealing with the production of radionuclides separately we'll talk about each process in detail but as of now we will be talking this thing very briefly so all the beta emitting radionuclides that are being used in therapy these are all man made fine and these are being produced either using nuclear reactors or by nuclear or by radionuclide generators and all the uh, Uh, radionuclides that are being uh, that are being decaying by means of beta emission uh, these are uh, generally produced in a reactor either by fission process either by fission of uranium 235 or by neutron capture reaction that is all the beta emission beta emitting radionuclides that are being uh, it can be uh, produced either in a reactor uh, by fission of uranium 235 or by the neutron capture reactions fine and these neutron capture reactions can be again of two different types it can be a n gamma reaction or it can be a n p reaction fine so uh, that's about beta emitting radionuclides and if you uh, take the example of an alpha emitting radionuclide like astatine 211 uh, like in this case we have astatine 211 over here in which decays by emitting an alpha particle and these have a lower range so how is this astatine being produced so this astatine is produced in a medium energy cyclotron on a natural bismuth target so the target for production of astatine is bismuth bismuth 209 and this bismuth target is being bombarded by a beam of alpha particles having energy 22 to 28 mev and post irradiation of this uh, target by alpha particles so it produces astatine 211 and also liberates two neutrons fine and this astatine can be separated from this mixture by a process called as dry distillation process 
and that's the basic equation or basic nuclear reactions that govern the production of estatine from the bismuth target fine and these are the series of reactions that are being responsible for production of the radionucleates that are being used in therapy like iron 131 it can be produced either by fission process or by the neutron capture reaction so in case of fission process these uh, uranium 235 ca uh, captures a thermal neutron gets uh, into an excited state and goes for a fission process and produces iron 131 along with some other fission fragments and in case of uh, uh, the neutron capture uh, reaction this uh, we have tellurium which goes for n gamma reactions makes tellurium 131 and this tellurium 131 this tellurium 131 goes for a beta decay process to make iodine 131 fine and these are other reactions that governs the production of these uh, phosphorus um, uh, the uh, the copper uh, lutetium and so on and so forth and these are cyclotron produced uh, and these example being the estatine 211 uh, which, uh, which explanation I have given in the previous slide and these are generator produced sort of nucleates uh, like uranium 235 captured say uh, neutron and makes strontium 90 and, and, and also with it uh, emit some fission products and this strontium 90 goes for a beta decay process and makes yttrium so that becomes a pair for the daughter the parent daughter pair and being used for the generator for production of yttrium 90 from strontium 90 and these are other reactions governing the production of other nucleates which you can see over here so the uh, radionuclides that, that are being produced directly by fission of uh, uranium-235 are obtained using a uh, radionuclide generator. Generally these are having very high specific activity that is activity per unit mass and they are preferable for the preparation of radio pharmaceuticals for TRT. Fine. So now moving forward to therapeutic pharmaceuticals uh, and if you go and look at the structure of the pharmaceuticals that are being used in TRT. So it can be simple lines like iodine 131 and uh, strontium 89. It can be some complex structure in which we can see over here in case of structure of samarium uh, EDTMP which we call is quadromat and which is being used in bone pain palliation. So in this structure you can see the samarium is the central co central atom over here and it has made several coordinate co uh, coordinate covalent bonds with the O and N atoms and these five N are the counter ions over here and th in the structure of MIBG which is being used in treatment of neuroendocrine tumors so you can see iodine 131 being tagged at the meta position and the structure of the meta iodobenzyl guanidine and if we look at the structure of yttrium dota talk so yttrium is at the center atom which has made several coordinate covalent bonds with o and n and that's the peptide sequence over here and that's very critical because with this sequence it goes and bind to the SSTR receptors fine and these are yttrium microspheres yttrium leveled microsphere yttrium is being bound to some microspheres having diameter and the range of 20 to 60 microns and these are used in a process called as radio embolization so now the next point is that uh, if we look at the efficacy of a therapeutic radio pharmaceutical so how much effective the given therapy will be depends on one factor that is that is we call as the tumor localization and these tumor localization properties of a radio pharmaceutical it depends on the route of administration that is like intravenous route intra arterial route and so on and so forth and for an ideal radio pharmaceutical so it should be such that it should deposit a larger absorbed radiation dose to the tumor with minimal dose of the normal tissue that is the ideal uh, characteristics of a ideal radio pharmaceutical intended for therapy is that it should have a large absorbed radiation dose to the tumor and minimal dose to the normal tissue and uh, and this requires the use of an appropriate radionuclide 
administered in a suitable chemical form with optimal specific activity and by an appropriate route of administration and it will allow and selective uptake in the in the target tissue in sufficient concentration to elicit a therapeutic response so if we want to deposit a larger absorbed radiation dose to the tumor so it we need a larger tumor localization and for the same reason we need to administer the pharmaceutical in a suitable chemical form with an optimal specific activity and also with an appropriate route of administration and if I do these parameters then it will lead to selective uptake in the target tissue and that is very critical to elicit a therapeutic response and different pharmaceuticals or different ready pharmaceuticals have different mechanism of accumulation within the tumor cells for example if you go and see the case of metastron or quadramet these which are being used in the bone pain palliation therapy so these drugs are being deposited in the bone cells in response to osteoblastic activity of the metastatic lesion in the bone marrow so these lesions are deposited to those bone cells which have the highest osteoblastic activity and these osteoblastic activity are being increased in case of metastatic lesion now uh, in the previous part a we have talked about the classification of uh, ready pharmaceuticals and we have seen that ready pharmaceuticals can be of two different types it can be an unconjugated or a naked pharmaceutical or a conjugated so what actually happens in case of an conjugated radio pharmaceuticals so we have a radio metal which is being uh, which is being linked to a ligand or a carrier molecule and this ligand or the carrier molecule is specific for a target fine so this ligand or the choice of a ligand or a vector is very important since tumor localization of a particular uh, radio pharmaceutical depends on the specific mechanism of the ligand interaction with the receptor or the binding site on the tumor cell so uh, these are some of the properties of the ligand which must be fulfilled for to be used in uh, radio pharmaceuticals and the properties are the first one is the biological specificity and in vivo stability for example we have a cell over here tumor cell over here and it has two receptor example uh, CD20 and CD40 and we have two ligands A and B so the ligand A binds to both CD20 and CD40 but the ligand B binds specifically to CD20 and the CD20 and the CD20 receptors are being overexpressed in case of diseased condition so which ligand do you use for the same we have to use ligand B the main reason is that because it is specific that is because of the fact that ligand B has higher biological specificity and second is it must be in vivo stable that is it must not be degraded by enzymes otherwise it won't be the same which is now secondly it must be highly it must have affinity to the binding site the thirdly is the stability of the ligand binding complex because when ligand binds to a receptor it forms a complex which we call as the ligand receptor complex and if this complex is not stable enough then it will again break down to form ligand and receptor so the stability of this ligand is, is also very important for the effective binding and fourthly that the ability to bind the ligand to a complex radionuclide so there are cases in which uh, ligand is being bound to radio metal which we call as the conjugated pharmaceutical but post ligation of this ligand to radio metal it must not lose its biological specificity and affinity and if it loses its if it loses its properties of binding to specific targets then it can, it can no longer be used for for, for targeted radio, radiotherapy so post binding of the ligand to radio metal it must not it must retain its biological specificity and affinity and if these conditions are being are being applied are being are being fulfilled then the carrier molecules can be used as an effective uh, uh, target uh, effective radio pharmaceutical for therapeutic intervention and these are the different mechanism by which the pharmaceuticals or the radio pharmaceuticals are being used in uh, TRT for example iodine 131 is being uh, goes inside the cell by means of a transporter which we call as sodium 
which he calls sodium iodide transporter. And with this transporter, this iodine 131 gets entry inside the cell. Same goes for iodine uh, 131 labeled MIBG, which gets entry inside cell by means of NET transporter. Uh, like Dota Talk, Dota Teach, uh, uh, these pharmaceuticals get are being bound to a receptor called as SSTR. And uh, and for these one, like lutetium label, these monoclonal antibody, these are specific for the antigen expressed on the plus on the prostate cells. Fine, and these are different ways by which uh, the tumor localizes to the pharma to the tumor. Uh, in uh, so these are different ways by which the uh, radio pharmaceuticals get localized in the tumor, and we can see diverse set of mechanisms involved in the same. So these are the characteristics of the ideal. A radio pharmaceutical so the first one is obviously it must be highly specific and must have high affinity for the tumor cell the second one is it must have high in vivo stability with minimum metabolite formation third is it should be it should have high rapid blood clearance fourth is rapid targeting and significant retention of the therapeutic radionuclide that is it must target that uh, it must target the tumor cell rapidly and must return and must have there for longer time for effective uh, TRT and fifth is it must have minimal uptake and retention by normal tissues in cell because our major target for the therapy is the tumor cell so it must not retain it must not be retained by our normal cell also so if retained it must be minimal so that it must not cause harm to our normal cells fourth is last next is the minimal hematological tox toxicity the fifth is acceptable toxicity to liver spleen and kidney and last but not the least so this therapy must not induce any radiation induced biological effects like mutation and transformation so it means that uh, it means that because of this radiation therapy or because of this molecular radiotherapy it must not induce secondary cancer by inducing mutations and transformation so these are characteristics of the ideal therapeutic for radio pharmaceuticals that are being used for TRT. Now the next topic of discussion is on the monoclonal antibodies and antibody fragments. And in this chart we can see a lot of uh, structures of different antibodies and antibody fragments over here. And these are structures of the murine monoclonal antibody. These are structured for chimeric one. And these are structured for humanized monoclonal antibodies. And the first generations of monoclonal antibody that are being used for the radio immunotherapy was of murine type. And in this case, both the chains are of mouse origin, but it has some limitations for clinical views. But with time, the development of recombinant DNA technology resulted in production of the chimeric monoclonal antibodies and humanized monoclonal antibodies and other complete human monoclonal antibodies, which makes this approach more, more easier. So if you look at this humanized monoclonal antibodies, all of them are derived from human orig origin except for the CDRs. So what are the CDRs? These are the complementarity determining regions. Fine. And if you go and uh, see the examples of chimeric monoclonal antibodies, so some part of them are, are being derived from humanized sources and some part are derived from the mutant sources. Like these variable regions are from the mutant sources and where the constant regions are from the humanized sources. And these are examples of the different types of these antibody fragments and these are these have the variable region over here so that's the structure of a single chain fp fragment over here and this one is a disulfide stabilized fb fragment so these two structure are just same but the main difference is that it is being stabilized by means of a disulfide linkage and this one we call as a diabody because both of them are the single chain fb fragments but they are linked together fine so these are linked together by means of covalent bonds and we call that as an covalent non-covalent uh, uh, single chain epifragment dimer diabody and these diabodies are basically bivalent because this one have a complementary to be defined antigen and this one will also have it uh, will, will also have a complementary to be defined antigen so both the uh, both the um, fb portions have a valency so monovalent one region and the other part, uh, region is again monovalent. So combining both of them, we have a bivalent engineered molecule, which we call as diabody. Fine. And if you look at the structure, these are the series of drugs being approved by the US FDA for diagnosis and therapy. And you can see some of uh, these are the generic or the trait name over here. 
and these are the target for these monoclonal antibodies and these are their type like for for making this antibody which of them are being used like whether they are of murine IgG type whether they are they are of chimeric they are humanized IgG type and so on and so forth and these are their uh, the FDA improved uh, indications like for this case uh, it is being used in the ovarian and colorectal cancer and one of them is like yttrium leveled uh, this one this drug which we call as zivalin uh, which is specific for the CD20 receptors and uh, the IgG subclass is murine IgG1 and it is being used for CD20 positive low grade lymphoma so that's the way how you uh, read this uh, chart of uh, chart of, out of here but what we can see over here the type of the IgG molecule over here so most of them being used for production of these monoclonal antibodies are of IgG1 subclass so within this IgG, IgG subclass there are different type of molecules and they vary significantly like IgG1, IgG2, IgG4 have a half time of 21 days in blood and also the way IgG1 molecule or IgG2 or 3 activate complement pathway are not similar so th that is the way how IgG1 will activate a certain pathway the same way IgG other molecules or other subclasses will own do the same so within the same subclass of IgG molecules the way the other factors uh, are, uh, are uh, behaves are quite different fine so that's why for making or for developing a uh, radio pharmaceutical for this uh, RIT or radio immunotherapy the choice of an IgG subclass is very critical and for making this monoclonal antibody the IgG1 subclass is being used preferentially like you can see most of the most of these uh, monoclonal antibodies are made by the IgG1 subclass and the main reason behind the same is that IgG1 has a higher uh, blood half-life or T half in blood and also it triggers potent human Im immune effector function like it activates the complement dependent cytotoxicity which we call as CDC or it activates complement dependent cell mediated cytotoxicity and other other pathways and that's why we need to go for IgG1 and that's why for making monocular antibody or for development of monocular antibody it is being done by means of IgG1 now we'll let's look at some other parameters like size penetration and clearance rate of antibodies and fragments so if we go and check out the uh, clearance rate of the intact monocular antibodies like the intact IgG molecule so intact monocular antibodies have long residence time in humans it can be from few days to weeks and it results in optimal tumor to non-tumor ratios at two to four days post injection so this take this results in optimal tumor to non-tumor ratios but it takes longer time like two to four days post injection but if you compare the same with in contrast to uh, the monocular antibody fragments they have much faster blood clearance and they also results in optimal tumor to non-tumor ratios but the main difference is that these are obtained at two to four days post injection but it can be obtained at earlier time points it can be in some days or hours and but tumor uptake it can be lower compared to the intact monocular antibodies ah, okay fine and this is the start over here if we, if we go and see that the size of the uh, intact fragments the size of the IgG molecule is 150 kilo delton so size is one factor that impacts circulation of circulation time of antibodies in uh, blood and if we go and check this one so a full IgG molecule antibody is a large 150 kilo delton protein and it can remain in circulation for three to four weeks and being metabolized very slowly by the reticulo endothelial cells but if you go and compare the case of a single chain FB fragment so they have a higher blood clearance time which is less than 10 hours of time and their primary route of excretion is renal excretion that is being done in 2 to 4 hours so if we go and see the uptake by the uh, intact uh, IgG fragments the uptake is highest for the IgG intact fragments but the uptake of the tumor by the single chain fragments are the lowest so for the intact one the uptake of the pharmaceutical is highest but takes lower but takes higher days or, or, or it takes much amount of time for the uptake but this one has a lower uptake but can be achieved in a shorter time point fine and for example it takes some days for the same and it takes some hour for the same so that's all about the uh, uh, the concept of monoclonal antibodies and antibody fragments as of now but when we'll uh, uh, go for uh, the radio immunotherapy, we'll talk about each term in more detail. 
so now the next topic of discussion will be on receptor binding peptides and we know what peptides are basically these are the polymers of amino acid and these peptides are involved in a variety of biological interactions and these peptides can be hormones protein substances inhibitors opioids and many thing more and this peptide it bind to specific binding site or what we call as receptor on the cell membrane or within the cell in order to initiate specific actions and these peptides are being over expressed in some in certain tumors in case of disease state fine and these over expressing receptors are being used for the targeted therapy for example in case of neuroendocrine tumors the SSTR receptors are being over expressed and these are uh, and these are being used as target for the diagnosis and therapy part of view but these peptide agonists are quickly metabolized by enzymes like amino peptidases post binding to receptors so whenever these peptide related pharmaceuticals are being made they are being chemically modified um, uh, they are being chemically modified peptide analogs and these analogs have higher affinity for the receptor and also it blocks the receptor function post binding these are series of peptide receptors which are being used as targets for development of the therapeutic related pharmaceuticals in oncology so like these receptors like SSTR 124 these are over expressed in case of different type of diseases like in case of neuroendocrine tumors these receptor levels are being over expressed also in case of small cell lung cancer breast cancer monocytes and lymphocytes these are being expressed to higher extent and uh, the uh, somatostatin uh, uh, peptides it bound to this receptor over here and initiates the cascade of pathways so if we want to image this over expression of the receptor or uh, if we want to we uh, use this uh, receptor as target we have to label our radionuclide with a given peptide so in this case we have to label uh, this octreotide analogs to with our radiometal of choice for uh, for diagnosis and therapy so the next one is we call it the GRP bombesine. GRP means the crestin releasing peptide bombesine, and this group of receptors are being overexpressed in case of prostate cancer, breast cancer, uh, small cell lung cancer, and so on and so forth. And the uh, and this bombesine binds to these uh, these particular receptor. So we can again image this particular receptor expression, or we can go for therapy uh, by using uh, these uh, receptor as target by tagging this bombesine to the given radionuclide of choice for the same reason and these are series of other particular receptors which are being overexpressed expressed in this group of diseases and these are group of peptides which can be labeled with the given radionuclide of choice for uh, for the therapy and diagnosis of the given disease and that's the example of SSTR receptor over here and that's the somatostatin uh, uh, peptide over here that's a sequence of the amino acid which the given peptide holds and these four amino acids are very critical because with these four amino acid it goes and binds to these SSTR receptors fine so these four amino acids are phenylalanine, tryptophan, lysine and threonine fine so we can make some chemically similar analogs which have the same group of sequence over here like you can go and see the sequence for DTP octreotide and these have the same sequence of amino acid over here and this sequence can again be used to bind to this SSTI receptor and can be used for imaging part of view or can be used for therapy part of view and these are other examples over here dot talk dot t dot nog which can be used for the same purpose for diagnosis and therapy and if you want more information regarding pprt you can go and uh, for find this video in my youtube channel and that's on peptide receptor radionuclear therapy using lutetium 177 dot for a neuroendocrine tumors and this uh, video is being made by uh, Ms. Paulumi Kumar from IIT Kharagpur. So that's all for today. So if you like this video, please like, share and subscribe to this channel and please motivate us to make more videos. Thank you for watching.